the, the kids want to go with my wife downstairs. She'll have something for you there. Or you can stay here. They have snacks downstairs too, so I might want to go. You do? All right. So we are in the six characteristics of a successful church, and we are number six, true worship. Uh, that's one of the reasons I play uh, the This Is My King, because the focus of true worship uh, is on God and on Jesus Christ. Let me turn this on. We uh, are talking about Acts chapter 2, verses 40 through 47. And we're down to the end where it says, uh, they praising God and having favor with all people. Praising God. So the early church worshiped God. They praised God. And that's the church that we want to model ourselves after to be successful. And uh, worship of God and Jesus should be completely centered on Him. Today we, we struggled with our music, right? Did you know that really doesn't matter? And we're going to get into it here in a minute. It's not the method, it's the mode. Uh, you'll go to churches that are a lot slicker, a lot better timing, they know all that. And someday I want us to be a little more professional, but never lose the heart. And uh, when we talk about this, that it should be Christ-centered. And that's why I like to have the call of worship to get our minds in a frame of thought and thinking just before we go into our music on God. Because, you know, we have announcements, we have prayer, uh, we have people coming in late, people leaving, whatever, moving around. But I want us to all of a sudden focus on God. And that is what worship is, a focus on Jesus Christ or on God. They're both the same, Jesus is God. But the focus on Him and not us and what not around us. I believe, and this may sound silly, but I believe if you're so focused at worship, you kind of forget what's going on around you. It doesn't matter if somebody doesn't quite sing it right, because you don't even recognize it. You're singing it. And uh, we're going to get into this. What the, I also want to, I meant to put this in here, and I always want to tell the story real quick, okay? So, the Bible tells us that uh, Paul and Silas were out preaching, and they were basically told not to anymore, but, you know, I'm sure they were Baptists because we don't do what we're told by the government. We're just, we're not very good at that. And so they're going ahead preaching and they arrest them and throw them in jail. And there they are, Paul and Cyrus, uh, in jail. And uh, jail back then is not like jail now. Now, jail now is not the greatest. I've visited people in jail. I remember visiting somebody in a county jail one time. And I got to go up to their cell, actually. And for some reason, the toilet wasn't working right, and it was flooded, and there was water all over the place. And I said, how long has it been this? Like this. See, this for a couple days. They just don't care. And there he is, standing in water, or laying in water. Uh, that's pretty awful. Jail back then, a lot of times, was they would just throw you in a hole. It, it wasn't jail like now. It wasn't good. Was there rats there? Yeah, there would be rats there because they want to come eat your food if it was edible. Sometimes maybe the food wasn't even great for the rats. And there they are. They're in jail. It's at night. And maybe they were more Pentecostal because Baptists, I could see Baptists sitting there and complaining. Oh, this is awful. God, I'm trying to help you. Where are you, God? Why can't you? And I can just, you know, that's how I would probably be. 
I would probably be depressed. God, all I'm trying to do is work for you and look where we are and nobody cares. And Could you see the spiral? Instead, the Bible says they begin to what? Sing and praise. Sing and worship God. And I want us to get the concept of how powerful that is. They begin to sing and worship God and then all of a sudden, guess what? There's an earthquake. And the doors open. And they get to walk out. The jailer was scared. And, and he said, don't. He was about to kill himself. Because if you lose your prisoners, that's the rule. You die. No, no, no. We're all here. We're all here. But because of praise and worship. True praise. True worship. Something miraculous happened. So there is power in true worship of God. And so when we want to talk about what true worship is, we have to go all the way back to Jesus to learn this. And Jesus was speaking to a woman at the well. And now she was a Samaritan and he was a Jew. And Samaritans and Jews did not get along because Samaritans were half-breeds. They were part Gentiles and part uh, Jews. And, and uh, the, the Gentiles didn't accept them and the Jews didn't accept them. So they got it from both worlds. And they were their own little section. And, and Jesus said, I have to go through Samaria. And the I, I'm sure it shocked the disciples because Jews didn't do that. Jews would go all the way around. If they had to go there, they'd go all around that city and, and go someplace, go wherever they were going. They would avoid that place because they didn't want to be caught dead. You ever had, I will never want to be caught dead. Me is Atlanta. I hate traveling through Atlanta. And, and uh, you ever get there during rush hour? I like to go through Atlanta real early in the morning or real late at night when there's no cars. Because you get stuck in that traffic. And I always say, I don't want to get stuck dead in, uh, in Atlanta. I want to be caught dead in Atlanta. They don't want to be caught dead in Samaria. And so Jesus said, I have to go. Well, the reason he needed to go is because he knew that woman would come to the well and he needed to speak to her. And that's a whole different sermon right there. But as he's speaking to her, she asked him about worship. Because the Jews say, you're supposed to worship here. And other people say, you're supposed to worship over here. And she says, you know, what do you say? Fine question. You know, that's the same question we have today. There are people who say, well, only a piano. That's the only thing you should have to worship. Others say, no, you need to have this big band and, and all of that. You know, there's some who say no musical instruments at all. None at all. And so Jesus, which one is it? What is our worship? How do we worship you? Fair question, is it not? Even today, what is true worship to Jesus? What is true worship to God? And so that's our question today, even, when I bring it up. True worship. And I say that, and I've told people that I want to be in a church that has true worship. And they'll say to me, what is true worship? Well, let's ask Jesus. And Jesus was asked that question. Jesus saith unto her, this is John chapter 4, verses 21 through 24. Jesus saith to her, woman, no, don't get bent out of shape. That's just how they talked back then, okay? Um, woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship, you know not what. That's a strong statement right there. And I do believe in a lot of our worships today, people don't know what they're worshiping. Again, that's why I played the video, this is my king. That's who I'm worshiping. He's undescribable, isn't he? We try our best, that was three minutes and 40 seconds. And you know what? He has a seven minute version. He left some stuff out to describe our God. We know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. 
But the hour cometh, and now is, when the, when the true worship, and true worshipers, shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And so Jesus says, to worship God, it must be in spirit and in truth. Now, I've heard that a thousand times, and no one ever tried to explain it to me. Don't you hate that? Well, that should be done this way and that way. Uh, okay, but what does that mean? Well, I'm going to try to explain it today. So we can get an idea of what true worship is. If, if the only way we can worship God is in spirit and truth, don't you think we should know what that is? So we know that we're truly worshiping God. And so let's look at the definitions. These are the Greek definitions. Don't you, don't you like that when the past, I don't know, pastor says that? No, I went back to the Greek. I took, I took uh, one year of Greek. And, uh, and then after that, that was the only requirement I had to have. I know very little Greek. And so I have to depend on books, okay? There's some preachers out there that know the Greek word for this and the definition. I don't know all that. But these are the Greek definitions that the Bible, the New Testament, was written in. Worship, a humble token of reverence and respect. Literally, it means to kiss the hand. Now, we don't do that nowadays. Uh, you know, they still in the Middle East or some European countries, when they greet each other, they what? They kiss each other on the cheek, especially out in the Middle East. Uh, I had a friend, uh, a lot of them have beards, right? And uh, he didn't have a beard, and he went to the Middle East, and he went to, you know, services there, and all the men want to kiss you from cheek to cheek, and those beards are rubbing on you, and he said he literally rubbed him red. To kiss the hand. To bow down humbly in servitude. That's worship. That's worship. To kiss the hand. A humble, a humble token towards the individual. A reverence and respect. May I say that a lot of what we call worship nowadays has nothing to do with humility. Very little to do with humility. Spirit. The Greek there. And again, how you know in the King James Bible, if it's talking about the Holy Spirit, it will always be capitalized. But you can also tell in the context. Here, this is a small s. In the Greek, it's a, a reason why. It's not the Holy Spirit. We don't worship in the Holy Spirit, even though He's involved. That's not what it's talking about when Jesus says in spirit and truth. It's the simple essence of oneself. It's all who you are. The source of personal power, affection, emotion, and desire. So do we get it? First of all, worship is when we're humble. Humble token towards God. And all that we are. And so when we come and we go to sing our songs, are we completely focused on the one we're here to worship? It, does he have all our emotions? Does he have all our affections? Does he have our attention? That's the question. Or am I too busy worrying about what this person is doing, what that person is doing, what was said over here, what the children, you know, they're being loud, or am I focused? Does he have my attention, my emotions and my desires on him? The very essence of who I am. And then truth. Truth is what we miss a lot in our worship nowadays. 
Truth is the true notion of God or sound doctrine. Somebody says, make some sense of that for me, Michael. Have you ever been in a sermon or a, a lesson and somebody's teaching, teaching you some truth, some good doctrine, let's say the doctrine of grace. And at that moment, you're stirred inside of you. You may even cry. You're moved. Because of what? The doctrine of grace. That is worship. The, you're focused on God, the, the, the knowledge of His grace, and it moves you. Sometimes it moves us to prayer. Sometimes it moves us to say amen. Sometimes it moves us to sing a song. Have you ever heard a song that just hit you? The doctrine of it? And it moved you? That's worship. And so it's the spirit and the knowledge together. It's a melting together. I'm going to read some stuff and talk, and we're going to get this together, okay? Churches today are prone to identify worship based upon the quality of the external. That's what I was just talking about. Oh, wow, it was a horrible worship service today. Why? Oh, the, the, the music was awful. Is that why it was horrible? What did I read about spirit and truth that had anything to do with a guitar or a piano or a trumpet or how great the music was? Did I read any of that in there? No. But most of our churches today are, they think worship is what the external is. How great the music is. Uh, sometimes I feel bad when we apologize for not having music or how weak our music is. Sometimes I feel bad about that because it, it doesn't matter. It's external. I'd rather apologize that we didn't create an atmosphere that you could be focused on God. I'd rather apologize for that. Did you know that you can... Get, one time we got together, we were just talking, and, and, and we were all moved about something. It was a death of somebody. And we were all passionate. And somebody said, can we sing Amazing Grace? And we sang Amazing Grace at that time, and I never, and you know me, you hear me sing? I, I'm not, so imagine a bunch of guys who can't sing, but we sang, and it was never sweeter to us. Because we were passionate at that moment and focused on who? God. So it has nothing to do with how weak our music is or how great our music is. It has nothing to do with the external. How attractive the building is. I can't worship there. Look how unattractive that building is. i got to be someplace fancy and nice. Trust me, I love our building. It's great. It's very welcoming. It's very clean. It's very attractive. But even if we had an older building, does that really take away from our worship? I've worshipped God outside in, 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 uh, on a, by a fire. What do they call that? Um, but anyhow, campfire. Thank you. Had nothing to do with the building. How many are in attendance? Oh, we're sorry. We just only have a few people. And, and why would you do that? Does it matter how many people are there when you're focused on God? Well, I can't go to that church. It's so small. And I just really can't worship. I just really can't get into it. That's a you problem. Not a them problem. How good the music is, or how gifted are the musicians? And that's where we get into. So many times people leave church now, and they don't talk about the Bible lesson. 
They don't talk about the truth that they learned in the sermon. They don't talk about the fellowship that they had with one another. The question is, wow, that guitarist is great. Boy, I love going there. He, could, he was really on it today. That's external people. I can't wait till we get a drummer. Oh, I can't wait. Then I can really worship. Really? And so, we're focused on the external, not the internal. <coughs> Christians today judge a church service or a church entirely. They'll judge a service or the complete church based on how talented the musicians are. Oh, I can't go there. They're not very good in their music. Tell me where that has to do with worship. Jesus said we must worship in spirit and truth. And, and he didn't add, and great music. True worship is not centered on the method, but on the mode. The method is the delivery of it. It's not really centered on that. Don't get me wrong. We should do the best that we can for God. And we should always give Him our best. And we should do the best we can in our music. That's not the issue. But too many times, the method is the focus. How we deliver it. The tools. Instead of the mode. And the mode is spirit and truth. Focus on God. Not on, not on how we do this. And so, too many times, that is the focus when it comes to worship. Jesus instructs us that true worship flows both from the heart and the head, spirit and truth. It comes from both the heart and the head, spirit and truth. Worship is, not a, worship is a true desire for God from a true knowledge of God. It's kind of this cycle. The more I know of God, the deeper I get to worship Him. And the deeper I worship Him, the more I want to know Him. And the more I know Him, what? The deeper my worship gets. See, the issue really in our churches today is that we have shallow Christians. So therefore, they are focused on the external. If we had deeper or long for a deeper relationship with God, and we really wanted to know Him, and we read His Bible, and we study it, and we go to church to be taught so we can know God, guess what? Our worship would be deep. Spirit and in truth. How many times, I've said it before and I'm going to say it again, how many times have you been moved spiritually, in your emotionally, because of a spiritual truth? You come to church one Sunday and you're all confused about something, and then all of a sudden, uh, it could be somebody just talking to you in the hallway, or, or the Sunday school teacher, or the preacher preaches on something, and he preaches about how God loves you no matter what. He'll never leave you, he'll never forsake you. And at that moment, at that time, you need it. And maybe physically you're not crying, but inside you're crying. Oh, I needed that. What moved you? The truth. The knowledge of God. And so this is true worship. The more you know God, the deeper your worship becomes. The deeper your worship becomes, the more you want to know God. And so, worship is to be focused on spirit and truth, focused on God and God alone. Heart and head. Worship must be Genuine from the heart. And that produces a genuine knowledge. 
of God. It's genuine from the heart and it's produced by a genuine knowledge of God. The essence of true worship is not external, but it is eternal. Internal. And eternal. Someday we'll worship God forever. How about that? Now, everybody thinks that means we're going to stand around and just sing songs all day and play a harp. No. Doesn't mean that. If that were true, that's still better than hell. Don't get me wrong. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5 tells us, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. The heart is all your emotions. It's, all, it's the very center of who you are. We're to love God in the very center of who we are. We're to love God with all our soul. And that, that's our spiritual being towards God. And we're to love Him with all our might. All the power we have, with all the strength that we have, we're to love God. Now, I'll get the reading. If you love God that much, do you think it might not come out in your worship of Him? Again, real worship comes out, comes from a deep love of God. And a deep love of God is not about music or how the quality of the music it comes from within. Moses sets down for the Israelites how they are to love their God. Our worship of God is directed by our love for Him. As we love Him, the more we want to know Him. And the more we know Him, the more we love Him. And so we worship Him. Is that not true? The more I know about God, the more I love Him. When that guy, when I have the CD of, of him speaking about, this is my king, and I, I feel stirred, I don't know about the rest of you, but every time he goes through that list of what Jesus did for me, and who Jesus is for me, and what God did for me, that stirs me, because I love Him. And the more I love Him, the more I want to know Him, and the more I want to know Him, the more I worship Him. It has to be in spirit and truth. Long introduction. We might just end with the introduction today. You have the rest of the lesson with you. It must be done in spirit and truth. This melding of spirit and truth as worship is summed up well by Jonathan Edwards. Now, some of you know who Jonathan Edwards were. Some of you do not. But in the uh, we had the Great Awakening here in the United States, which was a great revival, just before the Revolutionary War, by the way. The great revival. He is famous for preaching the sinners in the hands of an angry God. And as he was preaching, there were people hanging onto the pillars because they were afraid that they were going to slide into hell before the sermon was over. Jonathan Edwards was a great preacher. And he was one of the men who sparked the Great Awakening or the Great Revival in the United States, which I wish we could do again. He says, I should think of myself in a way of my duty to raise the affections or the emotions of my hearers as high as possible possibly can, provided that they are afflicted with nothing but truth. And so Edwards recognizes that truth and only truth can properly influence the emotions in a way that brings honor to God. Basically, he was saying that I wanted to bring truth to so vivid in someone's life, they are moved emotionally towards God. The truth to be moved emotionally. Too many times our church services and our worship moves people emotionally 
and they have a good time, and they feel great, but they go home with what? No truth or very little truth. And it goes away. Do you know that as you love God and you love Him more, does that go away? The love of God is there. Truth that moves you emotionally. The melt of both together. You can have that in singing a cappella. You can have that by just standing around and talking to each other and all of a sudden somebody says, praise God for that. And we all begin to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Truth of God moves a Christian church to passion. Church service, worship service should move you to passion. Not a passion for more music, but a passion for who? God. I want to be a better Christian. Why? Because I love God. I, I, want, to, I want to help others. Why? Because I love God. And a church service after church service, worship service after worship service, should make you passionate about your God. And that's the mode that we're looking for. A successful church will be just that. A church that wants to move people for passion towards God. The rest of it I'm going to go through a little faster. Three reasons for our church to promote true worship. One, it establishes unity. Ephesians 5, verses 19 through 21, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. What? Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Did you see where it brought submission to one another? Speaking and, and praising God and having hymns brought us together. Brings us together as a church. If the focus is on God and it moves us to passion towards God, then it brings us together. There's nothing sweeter than a church that is passionate for God all at the same time. Two, it establishes our purpose. Psalm 150, verses 1 through 6. I'm not going to read all of it. You can go ahead and read. But the last part it says, Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Our purpose as Christians is to praise God. We're to praise God, bring glory to Him, and to worship Him. We humbly submit to Him in worship. We put all of our strength all of our affections, all of our... And we're focused on Him because of the knowledge of Him. And our purpose is to praise and worship and glorify God. If you don't know what your purpose in life is, never forget that. Nothing sadder than people running around not knowing why they're here. Live 80 years in this life. And you have no clue why you were here. That's sad. The Bible is very clear. One thing, one reason we're here is to glorify God and to praise Him because He is worthy of our praise. He is worthy of our worship. If nothing else, He saved me from hell. If you stop and think about that, that's enough to worship for a lifetime. I never fear the flames of hell. I know when I die someday, I will go to heaven. Wow! I can worship Him all day on that. I can worship Him all day on that. I like what He says when He was talking about this is my King. He always kept asking, do you know Him? 
When we have praise and worship and we talk about our God and how great He is and what He's done for us, that's the question for every sinner that comes through that door. Do you know Him? Because if you knew Him like we knew Him, you'd be praise and worshiping Him also. And that's what I want centered in our church. People to realize, wow, those people are passionate about God. They love Him. And I want to know that God. Number three, it establishes passion. We have a passion for God. Uh, you can read there in Psalms 86, verses 8 through 13. Among the gods there is none like unto thee. O Lord, neither are there any works like unto thy works. All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee. O Lord, and shall give glory thy name, glor and shall glorify thy name. For thou art great and dost wondrous things. Thou art God alone. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and I walk in thy what? Truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. I will praise thee, O Lord my God, with all my heart, all that I am. Remember, the heart is all that I am. Do you see where the truth part and the heart is in there? All that I am, with what I know about you, God, I will praise you, and I will glorify thy name forevermore. For great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. You talk about passion? There it is. And as we worship God and we're focused on Him, it will move us to passion. And that's where I want to be. People who are passionate for God. But that comes from a love of God. That comes from a knowledge of God. So we can have a deeper worship of God. True worship. And that's what we see. Why is a church in true worship, why is it important? Matthew chapter 15, verses 7 through 9. Ye hypocrites. We're called that a lot, aren't we? You know, sometimes we deserve that title. We just do. Ye hypocrites. Well, did, and this is Isaiah, Isaiah Isaias, prophesy of you, saying, this people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth. Right now in churches, there are people talking about God. There are people singing about God. Using their mouths. And honoreth me with your lips. They're even giving God honor and praise. Sounds okay, right? Isn't that what we're supposed to do in church? But what does he say? But their heart is far from me. That's not where I want to be. Why is true worship important? Because it's not the method, people. It's not how you deliver it. It's the mode. Where is our heart? Where is my heart as an individual? Where is, my, where is the heart of our church? Is it focused humbly at God? Are we here to worship Him in spirit, all that we have, and in truth? If not, we just have words, we just have music, and we go home. Said, ye hypocrites, you talk a big game, but your heart is not with me. The very essence of who you are is not with me. You come, you say some words, you sing some songs, 
You pat each other on the back and you go home and there's no passion for God. That's not true worship. A passion and worship that brings that passion for God is what we seek. But in vain they do what? Worship me. Oh, you can have worship teams and they don't bring worship. Did you know that? Oh, we have an awesome worship team. Come and listen. That's not, they don't bring worship. It's the knowledge of God. It's the teachings of God. It's the love of God that brings worship. So they worship me, but they do it in vain. Teaching for the doctrines and the commandments of men. It's all in vain. You know what that word vain means? Worthless. I don't want, I, I, I want to be honest with you. I could be fishing this today instead of being here. I'm sure a lot of you could be doing other things right now. If nothing else, in bed watching TV instead of here. I don't want our church services to be worthless. I want them to have a passion for God. And that will draw the right kind of people and that will draw more people. And if it doesn't and we stay where we are, I still want that passion for God. Because that is true worship. I don't want worthless services. Three critical questions for our church today. How often does our church worship? I'm not saying how often do we get together to worship, but how often do we have worship? Do we just sing songs and say words? Are we focused on God? If our church were actively engaged in true worship, how would that change our church? What can our church do to initiate true worship in our church? I'll read the last and then we're done. Unless there's a real passion for God, there is no worship in spirit. At the same time, worship must be in truth. That is, proper, properly knowledge. Unless we have knowledge of the God we worship, there is no worship in truth. Both are necessary for God-honoring worship. Spirit without truth leads to shallow Overly emotional experiences. As soon as the emotion is over, so is the worship. I just want to break in. Wouldn't it be awesome if we had a worship service one time that I just threw away my sermons and went with whatever we were going with at that moment? Wouldn't that be awesome? Truth without spirit can result in dry Passionless church service. True worship is the melting of heart and head in worship, which brings a deeper worship. Imagine if our church was committed to true worship. Our success as a church depends on that commitment. A truly successful church has true worship. Let us pray. Father, we pray that you be with us today as we are about to have our time of invitation. And there be anyone here that needs to pray about anything, they can come forward and we'll pray. Lord, I also pray if there be somebody here who does not know you, who doesn't know our King, who doesn't know how great it is to have God in their lives, I pray they come forward and we can show them how they can accept your payment for salvation. Lord, we pray that as a church, Lord, as individuals, we long for true worship, a true passion for you. We pray for all this in Jesus' name. Amen.